Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today I'm here with Trent Horn and Jay Dyer, and we are discussing the resolution, Christians should reject natural theology. Jay Dyer is arguing in the affirmative and Trent Horn in the negative. And obviously, you know, if you've been paying attention to YouTube at all, you're familiar with both of these gentlemen. I don't think I have to give a strong introduction to either of them because they have a reputation as defending the Christian faith, and especially they've gone around debating various um, atheists and other people online, um, spreading, of course, the truth of Christianity. And so um, rather than giving just a long introduction to both of them, I think I'll just go into the format for this uh, evening's discussion. So we're going to start off with 15-minute opening statements, followed by seven-minute rebuttals, four-minute second rebuttals, eight-minute cross-examination periods, 30-minute Q&A from you, the viewers, and then we'll close with um, five-minute closing statements. So uh, I think Jay is going first, and so I'll get um, all that set up and ready to go. And when your time runs out, I'm just going to kind of holler in the background, but really my goal in this discussion tonight is just be, to be in the background and to kind of uh, not exist. And so, um, Jay, are you ready? Yeah, one thing I would like to say is just from the outset, uh, thanks to Trent for doing this. And uh, as I was telling Trent beforehand, I've watched uh, several of his debates, at least three of them, and uh, I think he's a really skilled debater. And the other thing that I appreciate about Trent is that he, um, I think he's a sincere person. And a lot of times in this domain, people probably aren't <laughs> that sincere at least not as often as we would hope, but uh, uh, I think that Trent is a sincere guy, so I'm looking forward to a fruitful debate today. Likewise, Jay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, Jay, whenever you're ready, uh, I'll get the timer going. 15 minutes. Uh, one um, thing before you start, yeah. I would like to add, too, is that I mentioned to you, Suan, before uh, this, that um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is going to be pretty dense, so um, I will be referencing a lot of papers and, and articles, scholarly essays that uh, Suan has agreed to later tag below. So if, if I blow past something and you want to look it up later, uh, we do. Uh, he, he does plan to put the references below. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me. See. OK. All right. So, um, you know, when it comes to this issue, uh, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of clarity that needs to be made. So, first of all, I want to say that um, I'm not defending a position that there's no such thing as natural law. I'm not defending a position that there's no such thing as moral law. I'm not defending a position that per se there's no such thing as natural uh, theology simpliciter, because it really depends on what we mean by the term natural theology. Uh, one of our uh, great theologians in the Orthodox Church, soon to be a saint, Father Dimitrius Daniloy, wrote in his uh, famous dogmatic work, Orthodox Dogmatics, that for the Orthodox Church, there is no natural theology. And this is because we follow the teaching of St. Maximus when it comes to the Christological character of the created order. So there's, in other words, there's a fundamental Christological element to the created order that doesn't allow us to bypass that Christology or that Trinitarian uh, theology to do something like natural theology. So from the outset, uh, Stein Eloy notes that when we look at the natural order and when we do what we, what, we might, what we might call natural contemplation, the content of the natural order and natural contemplation is the same as the content of Scripture. And in Orthodox theology, in many places I will show, uh, that is actually the doctrine of the Logi. So although it might sound weird to those that aren't familiar with this doctrine, St. Maximus's doctrine, which is really a logically consistent uh, position of following through many centuries and councils in terms of working out their Christology, Maximus is really the summation of this doctrine of the Logi, and it really is the uh, embodiment of Christ, we could say, in the created order, which really comes to fruition after the resurrection and in anticipation of uh, the eschaton. Uh, other Orthodox theologians, for example, continue in this tradition to uh, to point out that there's so many problems with the Hellenic idea of natural theology that really it go undergoes what we might say is a metamorphosis. Uh, Father Florovsky in his essay, Revelation, Faith, and Philosophy, St. Justin Popovich in his uh, chapter in Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ uh, on the epistemology <clears throat> of Isaac the Syrian notes that this is also in St. Isaac the Syrian an epistemology of the Logi. And so the fundamental issue here is that, as he notes, and as uh, Florovsky points out, there's a transformation of the terms and the words that the Hellenic philosophers use. Uh, the uh, great uh, convert to orthodoxy, Yaroslav Pelikan, 
wrote an, act, uh, an excellent book that also touches on this topic that I recommend uh, in more detail, um, where he talks about the metamorphosis of natural theology in the, the in the Cappadocians. And of course, the Cappadocians are going to play a huge role in what I'm going to try to get to today. Uh, so in other words, m uh, what we call the theology of nature or theologizing or reasoning about the natural world is not itself the problem. It's rather the reference of these things. It's rather the grounding of these things in an, ep an epistemological sense. And so St. Justin Popovich goes into a great deal to explain that orthodox gnosiology is unique. And it's unique precisely because it's a different metaphysic, a different anthropology, namely centered around the doctrine of the noose. In Roman Catholic theology, to my knowledge, I don't know of any place where there's an, uh, an explicit acknowledgement of the doctrine of the noose or the heart of man, which is the primary organ or faculty for knowing God. The doctrine of the noose will then play a central role in all Orthodox theologians that I'm aware of in terms of how we would exegete texts like Romans 1 or Psalm 19, which are typically used as texts to prove natural theology in a Thomistic sense. Uh, in this in this context, uh, most Orthodox writers that discuss or exegete the passages, they will actually refer to this uh, in a Christological way or in a reference to the energies of Christ. Uh, so in other words, the heavens declare the glory of God. The glory of God is actually not a creature. In fact, it is a energy that the saints themselves perceive and participate in. The world displays, for example, according to Romans 1, the divine dunamis. The dunamis in the Greek, if you uh, would look to, for example, the famous book by scholar um, Michael Barnes. Barnes notes in The Power of God in uh, quite a bit of detail that the theology of dunamis in the Cappadocians and in particular in St. Gregory of Nazianzus is fundamentally about the potentia that God has that he doesn't always necessarily actualize. In other words, God does not have to create, for example, all the possible worlds. He only actualized this world, and he did that on the basis of the logi that he willed to actualize. Uh, there's a great paper by uh, Seraphim Hamilton in our Discord uh, at Rule of Faith that I will, I will post below as well about this uh, position and issue with regard to the actualized logi. So in other words, Barnes notes that um, what is shown... Uh, what is shown in the created order uh, does not exercise, God does not exercise every power necessarily. Another example of this would be when the son becomes incarnate, there's a kenosis that occurs, right? According to uh, St. Paul and the Philippians. And in this kenosis, the son becomes a baby, right? He doesn't uh, destroy the world at the same time, for example, as he uh, walks on water. And what this shows us is that we can't have a strict identification thesis doctrine of actus purus because it would be then impossible for Christ to undergo a canonic state, enter into a mode of being proper to one hypostasis coming into time and space in a unique mode that the other two hypostases don't do. So in other words, natural theology right away would pro propose a problem in terms of its actus purus presuppositions in regard to the doctrine of the incarnation. For example, in Ed Fazer's book, uh, Five Proofs, Fazer literally says in the uh, chapter on the Neoplatonic proof that if this is the case, and he thinks it is a good argument for God, supposedly, then this God cannot enter into time and space because that would be to undergo change for that God, for that essence, right? But did Dr. Fazer not think about the possibility of how that might affect or negate or preclude the doctrine of the incarnation, whereby one hypostasis does enter into the mode of being uh, in time and space? For example, again, the action of creating the world for, by Christ is distinct from the action of walking on water. And neither of those actions is the same as destroying the world in the conflagration. So all of these things I think are important to keep in mind. Uh, there's an essay that I will recommend, a paper by Dr. Bradshaw, where Dr. Bradshaw uh, goes into quite a bit of exegesis in the Old and New Testament about this issue of the energeia and then being really distinct in multiple scriptural passages. So the energy's doctrine is not grounded in the Cappadocians or in Palamos. It's actually grounded in uh, the, uh, the the New Testament, Old Testament uh, theology itself, particularly Paul's epistles where he talks about the inner Gaia. Transposition, as I've heard it outlined in multiple debates, including uh, with Ben Watkins, is what I would uh, classify, not with the intention of mis uh, mischaracterizing him, he can he can freely correct me at any point if he thinks I've misread him, uh, is something akin to a classical foundationalist approach. In the classical foundationalist approach, um, especially in the Matt Dillahunty debate, we see a uh, basic empiricist narrative that the classic Aristotelian type arguments for change, act, potency. The problem here is that these all contain tremendous metaphysical baggage. God just is unlimited being itself, he says. God is not compo uh, composed. God is not in time and space. Um, uh, the observations of the world around us through just observing sense data then can lead us to this 
uh, supposed conclusions about this deity. Uh, he even says this is a first actualizer with no potentia, et cetera. Um, this has, of course, been subject to uh, many, many, many examples of critique in the academic literature, particularly regarding the not just modal collapse, but also what's called the identity thesis. Radha Gowitz's famous PhD thesis on this goes into great detail to show that, in fact, the Roman Catholic doctrine of uh, identity thesis is really part and parcel, especially in Aquinas, with what we see in Eunomius. Uh, and in fact, Basil's arguments against Eunomius uh, are quite the contrary to what we might expect, right? Basil does not accept the Eunomian or Neoplatonic definition of simplicity, which underlies the very doctrine that uh, uh, I've heard Trent outline. Now, the eternal actualizer point is actually ridiculed, ridiculed by St. Basil in Hexameron too, where Basil says that if it's, if it's the case that God is an eternal actualizer, then it stands to reason, like Aristotle thought, that there's also an eternal world that he actualizes. For him to have any meaning as eternal actualizer requires an eternal other than himself for him to perpetually move and actualize this, in fact, is why uh, Phaser himself has given up the, the project of using this line of causal chains or um, reasoning back to a first cause as if you can prove or uh, demonstrate creation as a specific ex nihilo action. In fact, uh, Phaser just submits and says, we can't do that. It doesn't work. In fact, the problem at root here really isn't about that. It's about the meaning of the term and usage of the classical theistic attributes. The problem is outlined in the paper that uh, I would recommend, Dr. Garibay's paper, which goes into great detail in demonstrating logically and formally the actual fallacies involved in theistic uh, excuse me, in the idea of a generic theism, the idea that natural theology can actually arise to uh, on the basis of theory neutral predicates, theory neutral attributes, the omniscience, omnipresence, eternality, uh, freedom, goodness, uh, creator status, sustaining status, and personal status of this deity, as well as according to, for example, Swinburne as, an, as a, 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 a typical Thomas, that this deity is also uh, deserves reverence and worship. This deity also is the same in all the monotheistic religions because they have similar predicates. This is, of course, a fallacy. The fact that these different religious systems have similar predicates for the deity, it does not follow logically that they are referring to the same deity. But this is, in fact, what underlies all natural theological argumentation about the Abrahamic monotheistic faiths. And in fact, I've heard Trent argue many times that the Abrahamic or, Abrahamic or monotheistic religion is a common core generic type of theism that we see in these authors. For example, it doesn't work to say that uh, all the predicates are referring to the same referent merely because they have different, again, because they have different systems, because I can give you multiple examples, such as the quantifier shift fallacy, where, for example, if we were looking at the fact that because monotheistic religions all claim to believe in one God, it does not follow logically that they believe in or refer to the same God. Again, that is the quantifier shift fallacy. We can think of examples like every girl loves uh, one boy, therefore every girl loves the same boy or every person is born of a woman, therefore every person is born of the same woman. It's an obvious fallacy and doesn't logically follow. This also relates to the what in log, uh, linguistic philosophy or logic is called the non-substitutivity of identicals in uh, linguistic intentional context, right? So in other words, we can't just substitute words as if they mean the same thing because they even, they, even if they might refer to the same thing. So for example, we could think of an example where uh, I list to you, uh, I'm thinking of a man who is a famous Greek, uh, a famous uh, lover and promoter of philosophy, uh, a very wealthy patrician, uh, and his name is Aristotle. Now, we might both intend to have the same referent, but in fact, we aren't thinking of the same thing because I might be thinking of Aristotle, the philosopher in the ancient world. You might be thinking of Aristotle, Onassis, the famous billionaire of recent memory. These are good examples as well as something like uh, the, the, we could give another example such as the one true God is the Trinity. Aristotle believed in one God. Therefore, Aristotle believed in the Trinity. Well, obviously, that's not true. No one would accept that. And what that shows is that you can't substitute the identity of identical words uh, without looking at the intentional epistemic context. And this is, again, just another problem that, that plagues the theistic, or excuse me, the, the assumptions of uh, basic generic theism. The other problem, of course, is that it ought to lead to perennialism. If there's a common core religion, which is actually the presupposition of uh, natural theology in terms of its monotheistic predicates, then we are bypassing the Trinity and we're actually arguing for something other than the content of the, the, the systems of Judaism, Christianity, uh, and Islam. So in other words, it would be a fourth core position that is the real position distinct from the other three. 
And in fact, as we saw in the Swinburne example, the attributes, one of those attributes he lists is that we should obey God. Well, uh, the obedience required to God is mutually exclusive in these different systems. So in Islam, a Muslim doesn't allow that, that you can obey the same God in the same way in Christianity, even though they might say or believe falsely that we have the same God. In fact, I could just simply refer to Jesus's explication of, the, uh, of this notion in the New Testament when from John 5 to John 9, this very question comes up where Jesus says that even if you think or reference the Father, you don't have any access to the Father apart from me. And ultimately, what is the goal of apologetics? Just to mentally convince people of a position? No, it's actually to convince them logically that there are good reasons or only good reasons or that Christianity is the only position that should be accepted. We, in other words, we aren't intending to create uh, uh, no, more philosophers uh, in a Hellenic pagan sense. We're actually intending to uh, convert people to Christ. Now, uh, when I hear uh, Trent's approach, really what I want to drill down to is that this the, the Trent's approach is based on a presupposition about how uh, epistemology works. And Trent basically follows the ancient and medieval world's approach that metaphysics is prior to epistemology. Of course, after human Kant, the whole modern world questions this and actually just ask for a justification for assuming that you can do your metaphysics before you do the legwork of your epistemology. In other words, you have now a gigantic epistemic bootstrapping agenda that you have to get through if you want to demonstrate any of your first principles or arguments that you would make on the basis of those first principles. So because he follows the peripatetic axiom of Aquinas, Aquinas accepts in De Veritate, the uh, peripatetic axiom, at least as far as I can tell, <laughs> uh, Trent uh, accepts it. I don't. I haven't heard anything that makes me think he doesn't. Then the peripatetic axiom literally states that anything that is there's nothing in the intellect that's not first in the senses. And of course, the devastating critique of this uh, that many modern epistemologists have pointed out is that that proposition itself is not evident in sense experience. So, in other words, now Trent is in the horns of a dilemma because if he wants to argue on the assumption of Aristotelian anthropology and epistemology, then he's stuck in the, the position of affirming what Aristotle says in posterior analytics, prior analytics, physics, and I'll reference these later, that there's two ways that we uh, go about knowing things. One is that which is better known in itself and that which is better known by us, right? That which is better known by us <clears throat> uh, refers to the empirical evidence that we have referring back to the first cause. In All right, Jay, case, uh, try to wrap up your your opening statement. How much time do I have? Uh, technically, the time's run out, but I don't want to cut you off like uh, from whatever your final thought was. Okay, so uh, essentially, this results in uh, I'll, I'll get to this later, perhaps, but uh, this is just a, a way to restate the point that the peripatetic axiom itself uh, is not self justifying or self referential. And so this would mean that really none of Trent's arguments or claims from natural theology would, have got, would get off the ground until he deals with the multiple well-known problems. This is my closing statement here of this uh, in modern epistemology, such as the myth of the given, the underdetermination of data, um, the inability to justify the peripatetic axiom itself, uh, that there are properly basic beliefs um, the, uh, that. Um, that there's an external world, um, that the external world causally impresses itself upon our senses. So that's that's uh, where I'll end it there. All right. Thank you, Jay. And uh, I think in the future, what I'll do is if we have 10 seconds left, I'll just kind of make the screen look like this and you can see like, OK, 10 seconds left. Um, but yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, Trent, are you ready to go? I'm <clears throat> I'm ready. All right. Whenever you start talking, I'll start the timer. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Swan for hosting the debate. I'm really glad Jay's participating in it. Uh, for the purpose of the debate, we can define natural theology using a definition from the First Vatican Council. God, the source and end of all things, can be known with certainty from the consideration of created things by the natural power of human reason. Eastern Orthodox philosopher Richard Swinburne describes natural theology as the task of reasoning about, reasoning about God, quote, from propositions which theists and atheists alike can recognize as obviously true. Now, let me be clear that people can come to know God apart from natural theology, like through religious experience. And human reason cannot cause us to desire God's offer of salvation. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it this way. Man's faculties make him capable of coming to a knowledge of the existence of a personal God. But for man to be able to enter into real intimacy with him, God willed both to reveal himself to man and to give him the grace of being able to welcome this revelation in faith. 
The proofs of God's existence, however, can predispose one to faith and help one to see that faith is not opposed to reason. In the rebuttal period, I'll address why the case that Jay gave doesn't refute natural theology. But for now, I'm going to offer five reasons why Christians should not reject natural theology. Number one, the Bible teaches that we have freedom in Christ. St. Paul writes, for freedom, Christ has set us free. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says Christians could eat meat offered to idols. Romans 14, they can celebrate Jewish feast days. Christians could also not do do these things if it made them uncomfortable. But they couldn't demand other Christians do the same. This means believers are free to pursue any kind of theology as long as it doesn't violate the teachings of the church. Uh, So if my opponent says Christians have a moral duty to abandon natural theology, he'd have to show where the church has taught this. And I don't think he's made that claim tonight. Uh, It's the default position that we can pursue it unless we have a good reason not to. But if Jay says we have a prudential duty, like it's just not a good idea, then he needs to show why the greatest thinkers in church history, like Aquinas, Augustine, Gregory the Theologian, John of Damascus, Athanasius, the Apostles, and our Lord Jesus Christ, why they were wrong in using this method to demonstrate truths about God. Reason number two, the church has infallibly taught the validity of natural theology. No ecumenical council has ever condemned natural theology, and the First Vatican Council infallibly declared, if anyone says that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, cannot be known with certainty from the things that have been made by the natural light of human reason, let him be anathema. So especially if you're Catholic, you cannot accept my opponent's position tonight. Number three, natural theology has a long history in the Christian tradition, both in the Western and Eastern Church. St. Paul declared in Romans 1.20, Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. My opponent agrees Paul is drawing from the deuterocanonical book of wisdom, which says in chapter 13, from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Even critics of natural theology like Andrew Moore say it is unquestionable that knowledge of God is here ascribed to man in the cosmos. Paul also told the Greeks that wanted to worship him in Acts 14 to turn to the true God who, quote, did not leave himself without witness. For he did good and gave you from heaven rains and fruitful seasons. In these verses, we have the beginnings of teleological or design arguments for God. St. Maximus the Confessor said, The saints learned of the Creator's existence from the things created by him. Design arguments can be found in Clement of Alexandria, Theophilus of Antioch, Augustine, and other church fathers, though with different illustrations. St. John Chrysostom says that just as a ship won't last a mile without a crew, The universe could not be ordered without a supreme intelligence guiding it. St. Basil the Great said, quote, The world is a work of art displayed for the observation of all people to make them know him who created it. Gregory the theologian gives an argument similar to the modern fine-tuning argument, which says the laws of nature are not the product of chance or necessity, so they must have been designed. Gregory writes of the world, Do these belong to chance or to something else? Surely not to chance. And what can this something else be but God? Thus reason that proceeds from God leads us up to God through visible things, which is the task of natural theology. St. Gregory of Nyssa said, Should he say there is no God, then from the consideration of the skillful and wise economy of the universe, he will be brought to acknowledge that there is a certain overmastering power manifested through these channels. So St. Gregory talks about dealing with an atheist. Uh, My opponent has previously said natural theology can't prove there's only one God. That's not what Gregory of Nyssa thought. He continued, if, on the other hand, he should have no doubt as to the existence of deity, but should be inclined to entertain the presumption of a plurality of gods, then we will adopt against him some such train of reasoning as this. And that includes arguments from monotheism. Paul said in Acts 17, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So in this incident, Paul acknowledged that the Greeks used reason to correctly arrive at the truth that God exists, but they were ignorant about God's saving nature. In order to find further common ground with them, Paul quoted Greek poets who said, He is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. 
From this, we see the seeds of the cosmological argument, specifically the argument from motion. For example, in the ambiguous, St. Maximus the Confessor says, nothing moves without a cause. Then no being is unmoved, except the prime mover. St. John of Damascus said, for everything that is moved is moved by another thing. And who again is it that moves that? And so on to infinity, till we at length arrive at something motionless. For the first mover is motionless, and that is the deity. It's about 700 years before the time of Aquinas. And according to theologian Thomas Torrance, quote, it was in fact on the foundations laid by John of Damascus that Western thinkers like St. Thomas based their natural theology. You can also find the beginning of a moral argument for God's existence in Romans chapter 2, 14 through 15, where Paul says Gentiles who don't have the law, Mosaic law, quote, show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. St. Athanasius argues in a similar way, saying of idolaters, for neither was the law for the Jews alone. They, the law, they were for all the world a holy school of the knowledge of God. Athanasius even said in the same passage that the holiness of the saints could be sufficient evidence that God exists. Finally, let's consider the history of the argument from miracles. The Old Testament prophet Elijah demonstrated the superiority of Yahweh by challenging the prophets of Baal to a miracle contest. Our Lord told his critics in John 10, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Jesus is saying that even if you don't believe his words, his miraculous deeds should be enough evidence to show he is the Messiah. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, Paul presents a list of witnesses of Christ's resurrection to answer doubts people had about the general resurrection. He also noted some of these witnesses were still alive, presumably so people could investigate them. St. John of Damascus said arguments for God are necessary for people who did not witness miracles firsthand and their converting power. He wrote, But since the wickedness of the evil one has prevailed so mightily against man's nature as even to drive some into denying the existence of God, so the disciples of the Lord and his apostles, made wise by the Holy Spirit and working wonders in his power and grace, took them captive in the net of miracles and drew them up out of the depths of ignorance to the light of the knowledge of God. Finally, the First Vatican Council infallibly declared, if anyone says that miracles can never be known with certainty, nor can the divine origin of the Christian religion be proved from them, let him be anathema. So we see in the West and the Eastern Church, going back 2,000 years, a constant uniform belief that the natural power of human reason can lead people to understand basic truths about God, his existence and nature. Number four. Natural theology is superior to its alternatives. My opponent advocates for a kind of presuppositionalism that claims it is impossible to justify belief in logic, knowledge, or morality without presupposing the God of what he calls orthodox Christian faith exists. But my opponent's case for presuppositionalism is refuted by the following dilemma. Either Jay is arguing from created things to God, and so he's doing natural theology, or he's arguing from the assumption God exists to created things in order to prove God exists, which is the logical fallacy of circular reasoning. Consider the first option in the dilemma. Uh, William Lane Craig's moral argument for God goes like this. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. It sounds like, if you read my opponent's argument one way, He's just taken out moral values and duties and replaced it with logic, knowledge, and morality. If God does not exist, these things don't exist. They do exist, so God exists. But if that's the case, he's doing natural theology. He has to prove logic, morality, and knowledge exist, and they have no natural explanations for these things. But maybe Jay is saying that actually, no, our ability to, to even have knowledge of these things or any knowledge whatsoever presupposes the God of Orthodox Christian faith. And so that needs to be the first premise of our argument. Uh, so instead of starting with created things and reasoning to the creator, we get the other horn of the dilemma. Jay starts with the creator and uses that to show knowledge is possible so we can know the creator exists. But as the Christian philosopher William Lane Craig says, presuppositionalism is guilty of a logical howler. It commits the informal fallacy of petitio principi, or begging the question, for it advocates presupposing the truth of Christian theism 
in order to prove Christian theism. We know this is the case because we could ask Jay, well, why couldn't we start with another presupposition like atheistic nihilism that says we're mistaken and we live in an illogical, amoral, unintelligible universe? Atheistic Platonism, which says logic, knowledge, and morality are just abstract concepts or brute facts. Polytheism, non-Christian monotheism, or many forms of Christian theism my opponent rejects, like Vantillian, Calvinist presuppositionalism, or just presupposing the God of Catholicism, who's absolutely simple, exists. And once again, the dilemma raises its ugly head. If Jay offers arguments which say these other presuppositions don't work and only his theology explains the world, then he's doing natural theology, but in a kind of strange backwards sort of way. But if he just asserts that his brand of theism just has to be our starting point because it's true because it's true, well, he's making an invalid argument we don't have to take seriously because it's assuming the very thing it's trying to prove. Finally, number five, the objections to natural theology are not sound. I'll address more of Jay's objections in my rebuttal, but I do have some common ones here that I have noticed him bring up before. Uh, one is on the issue of natural contemplation, that I agree that natural theology is not like natural contemplation in Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, that is the second stage of contemplating God after you've practiced the virtues in the act of life. Uh, but Dionysio Scleris from the University of Athens, he says, quote, while natural revelation is distinct from an argument from design in natural theology, natural revelation is nevertheless in the vicinity of natural theology, as it may include a short informal inference from perceived features of the world to the existence of God. Even Father Staniloy in Orthodox Dogmatic Theology says, quote, the rationality of the cosmos attests to the fact that that the cosmos is the product of a rational being. So it's there for rational people to perceive. We just might be having a semantic difference about who is able to perceive it and who isn't. Um, another issue that comes with uh, natural theology that Jay has brought up is, um, well, he's brought up before the issue of uh, empiricism, that you have to start with the peripatetic axiom. Uh, everything is in the senses and that can be disproven. The problem with that is that he's conflating Thomism with strict empiricism. Thomas doesn't do that. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says, quote, we should not attribute to medieval writers the kind of genetic or blank slate empiricism later found in the work of John Locke. Aquinas said our knowledge arises in De Veritate, quote, partly from within and partly from without, and that there is some truth in the idea that, quote, we already know that which we learn. So Aquinas' epistemology is not subject to the self-contradictions of strict empiricism because that's not what he's doing. Then that means that we can infer and apply concepts uh, when we see isolated things from A triangle to triangularity, A effect to causation, and then we can reason uh, um, from that up. Um, yeah, and otherwise, uh, yeah, I think I've covered... All of that. I'll I'll save uh, some of the other rebuttals here when I when I come back. Uh, but otherwise, I think I've shown. Remember, Jay has the burden of proof. He's got to give us the good reasons to think we ought to get rid of natural theology, all natural theology. You could even disagree with Thomism and pick another natural theology. This debate is not about Catholic natural theology. It's about natural theology in general and why we should give up something that First Peter three fifteen says can always help us. Be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. All right. Thank you, Trent. Um, yeah. And so that's that completes the 15 minutes uh, opening statements. And now we're going to our seven minute rebuttals. Uh, Jay, are you ready to go? Yeah. All right. And once again, I felt kind of bad, you know, stopping you at the end. And so when you have 10 seconds left, I'm going to expand the screen like this. All right. Whenever you start talking, I'll start the timer. Right. Well, I'm glad that Trent affirmed uh, Richard Swinburne because it was exactly the referent in my uh, the Garabee paper that uh, is critiqued. And the first thing that comes up, of course, is that Trent says that theists and atheists alike agree that these things are true. That's the very thing that I'm calling into question, uh, not the whether people pr think that they have things in common, but whether they can justify the things that they believe are in common. Trent goes on to say that he believes that this uh, demonstration shows a personal God. There is no generic conception of personhood that is not theory laden. 
Uh, I'm surprised that Trent thinks that there is because it's not very hard to see in the history of the debates of the church into how they went into noting that the notion of person in Christian theism is actually a revealed category. It's not something that's real, revealed or known via natural theology. And even in, in his theology, he thinks he could bypass the Trinitarian uh, relationships to get to some sort of personhood that doesn't specifically reference or pick out the Trinity. The problem here is that in most of Trent's references, he didn't actually address the issue that I'm bringing up, which is about rigid and flaccid designators. Trent just assumes that all the references in these various quotes that he quote mine actually prove his position when the very thing that I'm asking is about reference themselves. Natural theology is premised on the presupposition that the word God is itself, or the word monotheism is itself, a uh, rigid designator. It's not. It is not a pronoun. It does not pick out a specific referent. Within scripture itself, we have many examples of the word God being used in this flaccid way. For example, God can pick out demons. God can pick out the uh, persons or the essence or the attributes of the one true God. God can pick out human beings who are gods to Pharaoh, for example, in the case of Moses. I have said you are all gods. So the word God is just a bait and switch in the premise of all of the natural theistic and especially the monotheistic argumentation. Now, uh, Trent is apparently unaware of the fact that the Cappadocians and nobody before the time of the 1600s, namely, in, at least in English, the character of Henry Moore in the 1600s, as Dr. Branson has shown throughout his work, used the word monotheism. He just presupposed that when the Cappadocians used the word mono or arche, that they're talking about monotheism. Now, I'm not disagreeing with the meaning of a single God, but in the theology of the Cappadocians, the referent of the one God or the monarche is the person of the Father. It is always picked out as the person of the Father. In fact, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. So we have the preeminence of personhood. And in any Trinitarian theology, we pick out the person of the Father. And that's the only way in which the mode of person exists. There's no such thing as a generic mode of person. For Trent's arguments to work at all, for, for him to say that there's a generic conception of personhood or that God has a generic personhood that permeates the universe that he knows apart from Father, Son, and Spirit, which is what his position necessitates, is literally impossible. There is no such thing. And again, the fallacies that are listed in the Garabee paper show in multiple ways and in multiple examples how the word God is simply not a rigid designator. It's flaccid. So it doesn't tell you what it's picking out without the context of the rest of the beliefs. And I gave examples from contrasting it with Islam, or we could contrast it with something even, even absurd like a, a cult, right? It, there's plenty of cults that say, well, I believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. Does that mean the referent is the same because it's the same word? No, it's begging the question. And Trent is acting like these are not real philosophical questions that you can't demonstrate this in a, in a formal, logical way, which the Garabee paper does and which I gave multiple examples showing it. Now, uh, again, as we move on, the, the Greek word uh, of polytheia is usually contrasted right by the church by the cappadocians and the early church fathers to the monoarche monoarche is not the same thing as monotheia monotheia which again there's nothing inherently wrong with it it really depends on the context and the embedded meaning that it has in the theory in which it's embedded and so this is how words and language work and so trent is acting like there's no been no development or no no questions that are relevant that have been asked since the ancient and medieval world but the ancient and medieval world didn't typically ask theory laden presuppositional paradigm level questions that Hume and Kant do ask. So it's fine if Trent doesn't want to address the types of things that Hume and Kant bring up in regard to linguistics and somebody like Vico and later linguistic philosophers bring up in regard to referent questions. But that's precisely the type of question that I'm asking. And that's what the Garabee paper critique critiques in the fallacy that underlies the assumption of general theism. There is no general general theism unless Trent can show how somehow a priori or somehow from the created order, he has a generic conception of personhood that at the same time matches up to the Muslim conception of personhood, but also somehow matches up to personhood in Christian Trinitarian theology. But guess what? It doesn't. If you ask a Muslim, any Muslim, go into the Muslim system about what the personhood of God is, it does not mean what the Cappadocians and St. Cyril and the church fathers who is, it, it wrote tons of pages explicating what prosopon and hypostasis means. doesn't mean that at all. Totally different. Totally different. The fact that there's overlap does not prove a common core religion any more than 
two card games that are played because they have cards and because they have rules in common share, therefore, a common core card game. There's nothing in common between Crazy Eights and poker simply because there's cards and rules. This is the fallacy that his whole position rests on is that there is that thing. Now, he went on to cite Augustine, Aquinas, Athanasius, Gregory, and Altianzus, uh, as if they teach the same thing, and they don't. That's a presupposition, which multiple writers, Dr. Bradshaw, the Rod Galwitz thesis shows that they do not, in fact, teach the same thing. He mentioned that God's eternal power is seen, uh, quoting the text that I quoted. God's eternal power, I don't even think in your view, is created. Do you think that creatures can see the eternal power in this life? I don't think he thinks that because he believes in you know the beatific vision. You don't have a direct perception of God in this life, especially not in the Analogia Entis doctrine of Aquinas. Now he tried to cite Maximus as if it, as of Maximus's text about natural law or natural contemplation proved natural theology in his system. But in fact, Maximus, according to Sashinsky, a Roman Catholic, uh, now Orthodox scholar of the Filioque and the Middle Ages, says to utilize the language of later theology, Maximus's program uh, there can be is that there can be no analogia entis without the analogia fide. So if I were to give you a, a chart to show how this works in Maximus' system, it's actually directed this way. We perceive creatures which direct us to the principles, which direct us to the logi, which direct us to the logos. The logos is a rigid designator. It means the second person of the Godhead. It does not mean something like the logos of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And so that logos is another good example of the fact that the fact that the word were omniscience or eternal or one God is used is irrelevant to actually demonstrating what the referent is. Is that my uh, time or? Yeah, that's your time, okay. Jay. But thank you. All right. Um, Trent, are you ready to go? I am. <laughs> All right. Seven minute rebuttal starting whenever uh, Trent begins speaking. All right. So remember, Jay has the burden to show us that we <clears throat> we cannot use reason to show basic facts about God. I'm not saying that reason can prove everything about God. I, I don't really know any theists that believe that. I know some theists that go pretty far and think you can use reason to prove the Trinity or prove almost everything in theology. I'm not prepared to affirm that. Most aren't. Uh, but So I'm not saying reason can prove everything about God. But man, through natural human reason, can come to affirm shared propositions. So let me try to get through some of these arguments that Jay brought up. Uh, essentially, his primary argument seems to be Natural theology rests on the idea that there is a generic theism that can be defended because we all disagree about God's properties, his attributes, his intentions. There is no such thing as this generic theism. Uh, therefore, there can't be natural theology. But that falls apart when you start to think about it. Uh, to say that God is this rigid designator and it always has to refer to the Trinity, uh, that's false. Did Abraham believe in God? Did Moses believe in God? Yeah. Did they believe in the Trinity during their earthly lifetime? They Maybe yeah. they had an implicit knowledge of it. I don't know. But they certainly did not have the theological knowledge of the Trinity that Jay has or I have. Uh, so they did not believe in the Trinity like we do. Yet we could say they believed in God. Um, I think the problem here is that we have to understand that terms can differ in sense and referent. Okay? So when I say that... Um, uh, when I say that Cal L and Clark Kent are, well, that's the same person. When I say the morning star is the evening star, uh, you know, Hesperus is Phosphorus. I'm talking about the same planet, Venus. We just give it two different names based on how it appears in the, in the sky. And we can do something similar with God, understanding that people can make arguments and affirm truths about God. And the God they're talking about, they're talking about the same referent, but it differs in sense. And I'll give you a parallel argument. I believe water exists, and Aristotle believed water exists. But I believe also that water is H2O. Aristotle didn't do that. Aristotle and I have very dramatically different views about what water is. But we can still both affirm that water exists. Water is wet. Water quenches thirst. Even though we don't agree on all the propositions related to water and its existence, we agree on the most important core ones. And the paper that Dyer is referring to, I, I think it's from some atheist professor in the University of Budapest. I remember reading it a while ago. He misses this when saying that, yeah, just because something shares something in common doesn't mean it's the core, but it's an essential property. You take it away, it loses its essence and its identity. So even though natural theologians disagree amongst each other, 
they can still affirm the same propositions about that reference. They can affirm there is one God, there is that polytheism is false, that God created the world, that God is immaterial, that God is beyond time, that God is all powerful, worthy of worship. And we do see this in natural theology. Among the classical theologians, uh, Avicenna, uh, Aristotle, Aquinas, Anselm, for 2,000 years history, they affirm even more divine immutability, simplicity, other things like that. Now, you might reject some of that natural theology, like divine simplicity. That's okay. We're not debating particular natural theologies. We're debating the concept itself. So I think Jay's main concern here is, okay, um, you know, you can you can use this. You know, you're saying he said earlier, well, you've got a bunch of metaphysical baggage in, you know, trying to affirm Catholic theology and orthodoxy doesn't have metaphysical baggage, uncreated energies, uh, energy essence distinction. I'm not saying those things are false. I'm just saying that Jay will have to do the same kinds of natural theology explanations that I would for the attributes that I believe in. He just calls it by another name, by this presuppositionalism. Um, no, I'm not. The fact that all monotheists believe in one God and we can say that they're worshiping the same God does not commit the quantifier shift fallacy. Uh, because I could say every astronomer believes there is one star in our solar system. And it follows from that basic truth. Every astronomer studies the same star in our solar system because they're, com they're all committed to the view our solar system has only one star. We can say the same for the fathers of the church, for even other world religions. If someone's committed, there is one ultimate infinite creator, then they're giving worship to this being but they disagree about it. They disagree about the propositions that are involved. Uh, and as I said before, uh, Jay's presuppositionalism, just, well, we'll just presuppose the God of Orthodox Christian theism. That doesn't get us out of the lurch because you could easily presuppose any of these other competitors. He hasn't given us an independent reason to see otherwise. Instead, what he's given us is something that practices circular reasoning uh, to say, well, we have to, that's because I he hasn't, defended as much in this debate, but that would be my question to him. If we don't use natural theology, how would we demonstrate to people that God exists? And the view he's endorsed previously is just, well, we can we know that the foundational truth, that Jay says we can't believe in foundational truths, but he hasn't given an argument, by the way, to say that we can't believe in foundational truths like, foundational I mean self-evident, by the way, that we don't need other reasons to believe in these truths. Otherwise, you'd have an infinite regress. He has not given us a reason to think there aren't self-evident truths that are immediately available to us from which we can reason about reality and then to reality's origin. Self-evident truths like, I exist. I experience mental change. Uh, I am having perceptions. Perceptions may not be accurate, but I'm having perceptions of some kind. And then building from these self-evident truths to say, well, I'm limited, I'm contingent, I'm changing, that there has to be some kind of explanation given other things that we perceive. Uh, Jay said that, you know, Hume showed that we can't have these basic truths about causality. Um, Hume's just wrong about that, frankly. We can get into that more into my next rebuttal. But yeah, ultimately, if the arguments Jay is making against natural theology would also apply to presuppositionalism. The only way he can get out of it is to say, well, no, presuppositionalism just is true. It just is our starting founding point. And we know that because it's the true revelation, which of course is circular reasoning. It's like saying the Bible, it's like saying the Bible is the word of God. The Bible says God exists, therefore God exists. Circular arguments are invalid. Instead, natural theology provides us the valid way to show that God does exist. All right. Thank you, Trent. We're now getting into our four minute rebuttal section. Um, so this is now Jay's four minute rebuttal. Jay, whenever you're ready, uh, just go right ahead. Yeah, I'm glad that Trent referenced something as uh, easily philosophically uh, just just to devastating to his positions like like the <laughs> Cartesian position that I can have a self-evident knowledge of my own existence. I mean, this has been, uh, you know, savagely refuted by both Kant and uh, Bertrand Russell in numerous ways to demonstrate that there is no self-evident uh, positions and the epistemic bootstrapping thing that Trent's system is committed to is impossible for him to do. In other words, he affirmed a position which, which is known there as a kind of strong foundationalism. The problem with strong foundationalism is that for something like Descartes' position to make the statement to be meaningful that I exist assumes a host of things that he's not justified. And the whole point with his position is that you shouldn't affirm things that you can't justify 
in terms of starting points. So Trent is misunderstanding that I'm critiquing the starting points of his position. I'm not saying that I don't have to do legwork and that, that orthodoxy doesn't have metaphysics. It's an issue of accounting for the metaphysics. It's not an issue of do I believe in metaphysics? Do we share metaphysical notions in common like teleology or causation? It's a question of justifying, giving an account for and grounding those principles, JTB and of course the fourth uh, position if we look at the Gettier problem. Now, he continues to say that reason can say some things about God. And again, this response just presupposes that God is a rigid designator. He attributed to me the position that God must be a rigid designator. If it's going to pick out something that's common to the religions, then yes. I mean, is Trent arguing for a generic God that isn't picked out somehow? No, of course. And the fact that he goes into uh, attributes like person or personal shows that this, again, doesn't work because there's no generic theory, neutral concept of person apart from in the Christian paradigm, the Trinity. Uh, Trent doesn't have a basic understanding of what the presuppositional argument is. It's not a circular argument that just says it's true because therefore it's true and I cite it and therefore it's true. It's nothing like that. It's a comparison of paradigms because it's a metalogical question. So Trent keeps collapsing every question into logical questions when the very question I'm raising to him is metalogical. I'm asking prior questions to metaphysics about the epistemology that goes that's behind doing the metaphysics. And that's what the, the modern philosophers ask. I'm not saying that David Hume is right in his skepticism. I'm merely asking his questions. That doesn't mean that I'm committed to Humeanism or Kantianism. I'm asking the questions that they ask to foundationalist systems, especially strong foundational systems, which Trent just affirmed in the I exist. Well, are you not aware that I exist presupposes that language has meaning? It presupposes that there's an I or a self. It presupposes that there's time determination. Existing is occurring. Those are heavy metaphysical claims and baggage that are not demonstrable on Descartes' foundational cogito. They're assumed. And the business of philosophy is to question assumptions. And that's precisely what I've been doing in this debate. And Trent just says, well, they're just self-evident things. That doesn't get you out of the circularity problem that you say you're here to avoid foundationalism is circular. And that's why we say that there's two different orders of things in this question of paradigms, right? There's the day-to-day -day or mundane type of argumentation that I would do about logic or this or that proposition or fact. But metalogical questions cannot be resolved in that same way. Look at something like uh, Gerdel's incompleteness theorems, which show that you can't solve those types of problems in a mono-singular way because they reference them, they reference outside the set. So he's literally trying to repeat something like Bertrand Russell would say to Gerdell. And I'm just simply saying that set theory shows you as an example, as an analogy, that you can't just re re refer to the set itself to justify the set. It extends outside of itself. And the fact that you appeal to foundationalism shows that you're just self-referencing and doing the very thing that your position says is impossible. All right. Thank you, Jay. Right on time. Um, all right. Uh, Trent, your four minute rebuttal is, starts whenever you start talking. <clears throat> All right, well, I've showed why Jay's arguments against natural theology don't work. Uh, what about the arguments that I gave uh, in defense of natural theology? What has he said about them? Uh, I gave five arguments. Uh, we have freedom in Christ, so natural theology is the default. We're free to do it unless we have an overwhelming reason to think that we shouldn't. Jay hasn't really given, he hasn't attacked that reasoning and he hasn't given us any overwhelming reason. I mean, I think he's trying to say we shouldn't do natural theology because it doesn't work. And he's, he's come nowhere close to establishing that principle. Number two is the church infallibly defends natural theology. I know Jay isn't Catholic, but I'm just saying it because it's true and it hasn't come up and that's it hasn't been challenged at all. Uh, as to my citation of scripture and the fathers, Jay just kind of said, well, he's quote mining them. And he hasn't discussed, he hasn't refuted in any way the arguments I've brought up showing that natural theology using reason to show God exists. And go back and re-listen to what I said from the fathers, especially the fathers from the East. They're not talking about natural contemplation. They're talking about ways of showing non-believers. Gregory of Nyssa is talking about this. And he and I in the section from Gregory of Nyssa's Great Catechism, I shared an excerpt where he talks about showing atheists God exists and showing polytheists that there is only one God. So you can read it for yourself. I'll upload a document with my citations after this debate if you want to read that. Uh, my fourth argument was that presuppositionalism doesn't work. And uh, we've started to talk about that a little bit. 
But here's the thing with justifying knowledge. This is called Agrippa's trilemma. There's only three ways to justify I, proposition X is true. You either have an infinite number of other propositions that support it, an infinite regress. If that's the case, you have no knowledge whatsoever. Knowledge disappears under infinite regress. You could have a circular argument, but circular arguments are invalid. We agree that it's invalid. Jay himself even said that in logic, circular arguments are invalid, but he claims, ah, yes, but if it's metalogic, a metalogical question, then we can use circular reasoning. But here's the problem. Circular reasoning doesn't stop the invalidity, the fallaciousness of circular reasoning doesn't stop just because the circle gets bigger. If Jay says, well, yeah, circular reasoning doesn't work in any of this stuff, except for me proving the whole system that it comes from the God of Orthodox Christian faith, then he's now just special pleading. He's saying, yes, circular reasoning is bad, except for the one thing that I need it for here. And once again, with the whole rigid designator thing, uh, I would ask these questions. Was Muhammad correct when he said there is one God? No, he, he, was, he didn't fully understand God. But was Moses correct when he said there is one God? Or Abraham? They didn't fully understand the Trinity or God either, yet they understood these propositions. We can look at a series of propositions and see their truth value and the evidence that is behind them. So... Uh, Jay also claimed that so foundationalism, self-evident truths, uh, that they're actually not true or that they're circular. But he gave us no evidence to uh, believe that or why we should believe that. And I can use uh, elimination. We know you can't have an infinite regress. We know circular reasoning is invalid no matter how big the circle gets. So we have to start with things that are self-evident. And ultimately, Jay's position, his alternative with presuppositionalism, you'll see the shocking circularity ask him, why presuppose the God of Orth Eastern Orthodox Christian faith? Why is that our presupposition instead of all the other presuppositions I gave? The answer Jay will have to give is because it's true. And that, my friends, is circular reasoning. The, instead, we should not use fallacious reasoning in our theology for God. We should use valid reasoning. And that's why Christians should not reject natural theology. All right. Thank you, Trent Horn. Uh, now, at this point, then, we're going to get into our eight-minute cross-examination periods. Uh, Jay is going to lead the first eight-minute session and then uh, Trent will lead the next eight minutes. And so what I'll do is when we, when you have 10 seconds left, I'm going to disappear from the chat or disappear from the stream. When you have 10 seconds left, I'll reappear. So I'll just use kind of visual cues instead. So, um, yeah, Jay, whenever you start talking, I'll start the timer. Again, um, the question here is about presuppositions for sure. And I've listed many things and many problems for the foundationalist approach that you're advocating. Mm -hmm. You replied with something to the effect that, well, we, there's a trilemma that we could refer to, and there's really not many other options here. Well, the fact that you don't think there's many other options actually doesn't count as a justification for the starting point. In other words, you started with properly basic beliefs. And all I have to ask you is that, do you think that the notion of properly basic beliefs themselves is self-evident? Do you mean the idea of uh, properly basic belief? Well, if I said only beliefs that are self-evident or incorrigible, or uh, evident to the senses are properly basic. The problem is that you're in an infinite circular regress because the proposition itself in terms of, its, of you knowing it is not part of your sense data, nor can you show that it's properly basic without assuming it. Well, I would agree that the idea of a properly basic belief may itself not be properly basic, but one could just have no, self- No, that's not what I asked. Okay, what did you ask? The proposition itself about properly basic belief <clears throat> Is it properly basic? Uh, the proposition there are properly basic beliefs? The proposition only beliefs mm -hmm. that are self-evident or incorrigible or evident to the senses are properly basic. Well, I would just I would say that it's true. You're saying, how do I know what properly basic no, beliefs are? I didn't are? ask you if it's true. I'm asking, is that notion itself properly basic? So you're okay. So you're saying that if it is properly basic, it creates some kind of circularity if I say that? Yes. Okay, well, I as I said before, I don't know if the description of an idea might be properly basic, but the experience itself is. And then we then we have terms to describe what the experience is. It doesn't matter how you redefine it because the point is that there's no self-evident or or incorrigible uh, propositions like that found in sense data. Mm -hmm. So what's the justification for that? The justification is that there are some there are some 
propositions that we encounter, and upon entertaining the proposition, the justification is also immediately apparent. And yeah, so it that's, is that's, that's and circularity. So that's that's the problem of properly basic beliefs. No, it's not. You just, said it's, it's, you just said it's immediately apparent. That's circularity. No, because I'm begging the question. Okay, it's it's not that because if I say, for example, I am having an experience right now, I am just reporting something that is happening to That's me. That's not prop- all you're doing. No, I gave you multiple examples, which you said I didn't do in critiquing the cogito. Like what? Of all of the metaphysical things that are assumed in the sentence. Okay, but even if I don't understand all of the concepts that are involved, we can also... It doesn't matter. This is about justifying the beliefs. Okay, so what you're so it sounds like you're saying to me, natural theology is false because there are no self-evident truths. I'm cr- critiquing your position of a strong foundationalism. Okay, but even if someone picked a weaker form of foundationalism, yeah, I think but that's a lot not of what you picked. So well, you okay, what think, I would what I would say that, that's not the position you defended five minutes ago. Okay, but even the position that I have, I would just say a lot of people, even people who are non-believers or atheists would agree there are just basic facts about existence that we have agreement on. Okay, so you're from there we can the build arguments. So you're going to appeal to the mass that's actually a fallacy, it's not a justification. No, I'm I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's, it's Well, I asked for justification. So what's the justification? The problem is the, the problem is Jay, I gave you a justification but your system just won't allow it because those aren't justifications. Is... Those are fallacies. You're... No, I told you that some propositions that we immediate that we encounter that's their truth question. is immediate and we do not have to infer them. I'm asking for the justification. You're just saying that it's immediate, but that rests, on, I would that, say rests the, on, that rests on the assumption that the external world is properly caused to impress upon your senses. Fine, I would immature. I would say the the justification that the self evident truths uh, in my epistemology are true would be the same as whatever justification led you know leads you to believe that the God of Christian orthodoxy well, I'm not is the ultimate foundation. So I'm not subject to that problem. I don't make the strong foundationalist claim that you just did. So I don't have that problem. I admit circularity at this level. Okay, but but only at that level. Right, because it's a metalogical question where circularity is unavoidable. That's the point with set theory and the uh, incompleteness theorem. Okay, uh, are are there any other circular? So circular reasoning with God being the ultimate foundation of reality, that is not invalid. Um, are there any other it's kinds unavoidable of unavoidable by the nature of the system itself? Okay, so it's not invalid. Are there any other kinds of circular reasoning apart from God that have nothing to do with God that are also not invalid? Yeah, sure. The categories themselves have to be presupposed for the possibility of knowledge. So in other words, the way I make the argument is just simply that knowledge presupposes the categories. The categories themselves are grounded in God. Okay, so the categories themselves, their foundation is not circular. Their foundation is in God. Well, they're circular when we're considering whether we can justify them at the human level. Right. So we can't say that logic is true because the laws of logic themselves show that they're true. It sounds like you're saying circular. circular. Yeah, it sounds like you're saying circular reasoning is invalid, except when we're talking about God being the foundation of the universe. I'm saying that every system at root is circular, and that's what I'm demonstrating to you in your strong foundationalism. And I'm showing that that's not going to be then how we justify or explain the different systems themselves. We, it's a comparison of systems and not a comparison of evidences. Mm-hmm. But then I, I think, um, well, I don't want to actually, I feel unfair. I shouldn't ask you questions. This is your time. We can do whatever you want. Well, uh, let me move on to another issue, which was in the. I have a lot of questions of my own, but it's your time. Uh, in the, so you did ask me to go through different points that I haven't addressed. And that's just because of time. It wasn't because I was trying to avoid in the points that you made, but. Um, again, I think that a lot of what you said, again, I understand that you're attempting to say that, well, we can say that God's personal, but what I want to know is, do you think there's a generic conception of person that doesn't reference the father, the son, and the Holy spirit? I think that one can believe, well, there, here's the problem. There are a lot of different natural theologies. I don't believe God is a person because I'm a classical theist. Uh, there are others who hold that view. But I think that we can talk about God in being and something that is shared among the three persons of the Trinity, that God is not a person, but he has personal qualities. God is intellect. God has will. Uh, and so that is something shared by the three members of the Trinity. And that's something we can know, intellect, will, moral goodness. We can get that from natural theological arguments. So it doesn't. Emotion, so it's not an appeal to person. It's not an appeal to father. 
it's not an appeal to the Father Himself, the one that particular member. That's of my the point: is that in the Trinitarian theology developed in the councils, there's no such thing as personhood apart from Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, whatever I say that is true of God, uh, at least true of the divine nature, is also going to be true of the persons, uh, minus special revelation. So, if I say God is eternal, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all eternal. And the other attributes will follow. Yeah, but I'm not that. talking about that. I'm talking about the specific development of the notion of person and hypostasis and how unique it is to the early church and her revelation. It's not a doctrine that comes out of paganism. Right, but person, uh, the term person like uh, apostasies and prosopon, their meaning changes over the centuries, how they're used among different philosophers. Exactly. So right. like Aquinas, when he talks, you know, when we talk about the Trinity being three persons, we don't believe that God is a person like you or me, that it's an analogical term that best describes these relations that exist within the Godhead. Yeah, I'm just they're making not, the... I'm they're not persons the... like us. I didn't say that they were. I'm just mm -hmm. making the point that the development of the notion of person in the definitions of the Trinity in terms of who God is. I mean, the creed says, I believe in one God, the Father. So it actually identifies the unity, the oneness of God with the hypostasis of the Father and by extension, the nature that he communicates to the Son and to the but, Spirit. But then we'd also say procedure. the Son and the Holy Spirit are equally divine, though. Yeah, right, but I'm going gonna, gonna to have to st step in right here because the time is up. But uh, I'll let uh, Trent Horn do the eight eight minutes of cross-examination now. And for those of you who are watching online, uh, this would be the time to start sending in your questions that you'd want to ask either Jay or Trent. And so please include who you're addressing your question to, whether it's Trent, Jay, or both of them. And so once again, during this eight-minute session, this is the time to start sending in your questions in the chat. Um, with that, um, I'll step out. And Trent, as soon as you start talking, I'll start my timer. I have one question before you start to you, Suwon. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is is the Q and A then closing statements, or how does what's the order? Yeah, sure. So we're going to do thirty minute Q and A with the audience, and so I'll I'll be fielding the questions, and then after that we'll close with five minute closing statements. Okay. All right, uh, Trent. Whenever you start talking, I'll start my timer. All righty. All right. I just have a few questions for you, Jay. Um, has any ecumenical council ever condemned natural theology? Uh, if by natural theology, what you mean in the Thomistic scheme, yes. If you, uh, if well, I'm just talking about the proposition of man by human reason can come to know God exists. Yeah, but again, I didn't agree that there was a generic notion of those things, or that there's an obvious, clear example of what natural theology is. In fact, but my whole point was to debate the nuances mm -hmm. of it and point out that I affirm natural revelation. I okay, just, well, I mean, different, I mean different things by the terms. Sure. Then whatever the term means, even if it's a different meaning of the term, is there an ecumenical council that's condemned natural theology? I would say that if you get to the seventh ecumenical council, the implications of their iconographic teaching of reality, which basically identifies the notion of the Logi in terms of the, the world being a book or an icon of Christ, I would say it's implied there, but it's not explicitly going to say in an anachronistic way that I we condemn the Thomistic doctrine of natural theology. Okay. Um, does the Bible ever condemn using reason to know God exists? No, and in fact, uh, I don't believe that there's any dearth of evidence. I think that reason itself is uh, can be used as a transcendental argument to prove God. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the presuppositions a bit, because because um, uh, I think that you and I both agree it's important to demonstrate to people that God exists. Because, I mean, Absolutely. there are people, who, do you believe there are people who don't believe, and obviously who don't believe in Christianity, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. And it's important for us to present evidences to them to demonstrate to them the truth of Christianity. Absolutely. Okay. Then I'm really, really super curious how you would do that, that if you can't start with self-evident truths and reason up from the created order to the creator, tease out attributes from arguments, but you have to use a big circular argument, why presuppose the God of Orthodox Christian faith instead of any of the other numerous examples I gave in my opening statement? Well, because I think that ultimately philosophy shows us that what's at work here in the dispute between an atheist or a Christian or unbeliever is paradigms and not pieces of evidence, because evidences are interpreted according to, in my view, worldviews and paradigms. And this comes to the fore in modern debates following uh, Kant and Hume. So we wouldn't see this in the ancient uh, writers per se, because it's not a question that's raised in the ancient writers. I mean, there's many examples of things that I could say weren't raised in the first to sixth centuries that are raised in the seventh to ninth centuries, 
we wouldn't conclude that because they weren't raised, they were false or they weren't the case or they weren't, you know, they weren't true at that time. They just weren't raised as questions. But there are indicators of presuppositional types of argumentation, including St. John Damascus, Fountain Knowledge Book One, where he uses a transcendental type of argument to refute sophists, which he gets from Aristotle Book Four. Right. But, well, Jay, I'm actually not necessarily opposed to using logic, knowledge, or morality to to show God exists, uh, or even these, even a kind of transcendental argument. <laughs> My concern is the the specificity of the presupposition, because your case seem to be very negative to natural theology, its inability to prove a rigid designator, the, the triune God of Christianity. No, I, I, but, I do. All right, I agree. I so agree so my question for you is, what would prevent, why couldn't I take your exact same presuppositionalism, right. swap out the God of Orthodox Christian faith, put in the Catholic divine simplicity God, right. or, William, or Cornelius Van Til taking his Protestant view of God, using the same argument, what uh, breaks the symmetry to pick your presupposition over the others? Because in this case, what I'm the way I would make the argument is that the Trinity is actually the ground, not just of epistemology or logic or things like that, but actually the entire paradigm. In other words, it's an argument for the entirety of the Christian paradigm, not merely an argument for this or that piece of it. So the Trinity comes with, in terms of Orthodox theology, as I understand it, St. Maximus's grand metaphysic, it actually comes with a holistic epistemology and metaphysic that is the grounding of the natural world itself. So it's not just an argument for an abstract concept or some logical thing. It's the entire Christian paradigm and the metaphysics of the Trinitarian theology that we have as Orthodox, which is unique to us. And this is why, one okay. last point, this is why in, for example, uh, Questions and Doubts, St. Maximus goes to great uh, lengths to show that there are natural proofs for the Trinity. He actually thinks the existence of the world, the modal existence of the world itself is triadic and is a proof, not an adumbration or a trace, but an actual proof of the Trinity. Okay, but why, I didn't hear a reason, why, are, why is our presupposition going to be a Trinity versus a unity, a Unitarian God? Oh, I see. Why, because, right. why that's point one, mm -hmm. and point two, why your concept of the Trinity as opposed to a Catholic or Protestant concept? Why? Well, because first of all, uh, the, uh, the, the, the triune God is not just posited. I'm actually saying that God and the Christian worldview and the Christian Orthodox paradigm gives an account for the metaphysical problems for the, the one and the many, for the universals, for the, uh, for the, you know, logical, uh, categories, the, the Aristotelian categories that, you know, Maximus basically squishes into natural contemplation. I'm saying that the structure of the world, as well as ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, all of that is justified, given an account for and grounded in a specific triune God and the specific revelation of what he says about how the world's constructed. So it's a revelatory theism and a justification via revelation, as opposed to autonomous uh, uh, you know, the, the unaided reasoning uh, approach that you're defending. So you're saying that we should presuppose the God of Eastern Orthodox Christian theism. Correct. Because the God of Eastern Orthodox Christian theism has revealed we ought to presuppose him. No, I'm saying that we should presuppose him pre precisely because the self-revelatory declaration gives an account for the uh, problems of ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology that I keep raising. Why the is it Christian why, worldview well, solves those problems? What? Why does only Orthodox Christian? So, so I guess what I'm because trying to figure out here is the unique revelatory character of the Trinity in Orthodox Christianity. Right, but Protestants more. and Catholics also believe in the Trinity. Yeah, but you don't have it because you have heterodox versions of it. Not, I'm so, not I'm personally attacking you, but I'm saying no, that that's that's fine. Uh, but so okay, so we would pre we would say your conception of theism is the only one that explains reality because we would deploy arguments of reason to show that the competitors are false or don't succeed. Correct, but that's a category error but because I'm not just because I'm using arguments from reason doesn't mean that they have logical or epistemic or ontological priority. That's a category error that Thomas the Thomas constantly make that because I'm using an argument that it therefore has uh, uh, epistemic or ontological priority or that I use it first in a chain. Okay. And that's um, an it doesn't Would this also include um we only got a few seconds here. Uh my question earlier, did um, did a did Abraham believe God? Do you think Abraham had an explicit knowledge of the Trinity? Yes, and St. Maximus says he did. 
Okay, so he knew the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right. Um, uh, last one here. Uh, do you think it's helpful to offer evidence for specific historical doctrines like the resurrection? Like Absolutely. There is definitely a place for evidences. And okay. yes, that's part of the, the task of apologetics. I'm not, in fact, I believe there's nothing but evidence for Christianity. Okay. And then it can be helpful to offer um, maybe an argument. So we could show God exists maybe from a, a miracle that's occurred. Well, I would like, say the, like with, the, maybe the miracle of fire um, <laughs> for Eastern Orthodoxy. So I believe that miracles are kind of test to uh, the position. I don't think that they quote prove it. And, All right, and, I thank say, you. and I would say as proof of that, when Jesus is responding to the uh, guy in, in uh, torments, he says, let me come back and warn my brothers. Jesus says, even though one rises from the dead, they will not believe because they have Moses and the prophets. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I utilize uh, you know uh, prop, messianic prophecies all the time to to as part of the apologetic. Sure. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to get started now with the 30 minutes of just audience Q and A, and so let me get my timer ready. Um, so let's begin with uh, Luke Meister. He says uh, to Trent, "How can you say Abraham didn't believe the Trinity? We assume he doesn't have articulation of it uh, of the articulation of it that we do now." But he experienced slash believes same Trinity we do now. Amen. Well, what I would say is, where does the Bible record uh, Abraham having an interaction with uh, and knowing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I know there's a typology of the of the three visitors that visit Abraham is a typological reference to the Trinity, but that's far different from the knowledge of the Trinity you and I have of understanding Father, Son, Holy Spirit eternal generation, eternal, you know, spiration, or of course the different Catholic and Orthodox views on that. I think I would say just, it's very clear. Did people, was the knowledge of the Trinity among people who believed in God equal before and after the time of Christ? If you say that it was equal, I would say that historically and theologically, that makes no sense at all until the doctrine of the, the of the Trinity was revealed through the incarnation. All right, Jay, would you like to respond? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is a great example of how there's a fundamental difference between us because Trent's presuppositions are that there was not knowledge of the Trinity uh, in an implicit form in these cases. Of course, fundamental to Orthodox theology is that the theophanies are the person of Christ, that the second person of the Logos. This is unima unanimously the teaching of the early church fathers until Augustine begins to question and on the Trinity, I think book three. Um, and the fact that it's the logos and that that is so stressed in Orthodox theology and iconography shows that we've maintained this very point, which is crucial, which is that there is no generic God, even in the Old Testament. There's no unit bare Unitarianism. It was always the Father, the Son and the Spirit, which is consistently revealed all throughout the Old Testament, have multiple talks going through the theophanies and the Trinity in the Old Testament. Orthodox uh, iconography in regard to the Rublev icon, for example, is there precisely to stress this point. And ironically, uh, you know, Trent, Trent's own theologians uh, <laughs> in regard to if he was, I, I would say, if, if he were to go uh, uh, argue with a Muslim, I mean, this would be where he needed to go because, you know, St. Justin Martyr makes these arguments against Trifo the Jew to say it's the Trinity in the Old Testament. And it's not a matter of whether the word Trinity is used because the New Testament doesn't use the word Trinity, but we all know the Trinity is revealed. This is why St. Maximus says uh, the Old Testament patriarchs all had a direct noetic perception of the Trinity. And this is why Jesus says, Abraham believed and rejoiced to see me. All right. The next question I have here is from uh, Dro Meme Replies. And he says to Jay, how do you justify one presupposed system over another? By a comparison of the systems in terms of the internal critique to see which systems can give an account for the basic presuppositions of knowledge, epistemology, and metaphysics. Excuse me, uh, excuse me, epistemology, ethics, and metaphysics. And so if the various systems are unable to account for those basic presuppositions in terms of the categories, for example, then those systems make knowledge impossible. And so thus Christianity emerges as the only system or paradigm that gives an account for and makes knowledge possible. And I, I didn't get a chance to respond to Trent's other point. I'm, I'm not going to do it right now, but um, the Unitarian deity and the dyad deity have such internal uh, presuppositional problems that they make knowledge impossible. Yeah, Trent, do you have a response? Yeah, I would just <laughs> say that what Jay is doing is just natural theology in reverse. So he's starting with the conclusion of the triune God of Eastern Orthodoxy, identifying 
these elements of the world that need to be explained, and then showing why alternatives, whether it's atheistic, polytheistic, non-Christian, or non-Orthodox, don't get the job done. And that's kind of what I do. I just do it in a forward direction. I start with what we observe, show that nothing can explain this except for the religion that I'm a part of. So I don't disagree with what he's doing. I just really believe it's just natural theology in a reverse direction because he's using arguments to select between presuppositions. If he doesn't do that, then it becomes circular reasoning. All right. The next question I have here is from my name is Jeff. Uh, this is for Trent. So does your natural <laughs> theology presuppose analogia entus, that God is supreme being in the chain of being? How does this accord with the Father's teaching that God is hyper usios? Uh, and by the way, I didn't mean to laugh at the person's question. I'm hoping that's a reference to uh, 22 Jump Street, which is the movie I thoroughly enjoy. Because <laughs> um, I, I watch it on planes like all the time when I travel. Uh, yeah, I, I think I would need to hear more about what the person means by the the Eastern ver view of hyper usios. I would say analogia entis or, or chain of being. Uh, I would say that God is, um, I would affirm the essence uh, existence distinction. And so, and the analogy of being that when we describe God and talk about God, we speak not in a univocal way, but not in an equivocal way. We always have to use anal analogous ways of talking about God. While creatures participate in being, God only God himself just is being. I know Catholics and Orthodox differ on some of the finer points of understanding the inner life of God, but I think we both agree on the core concept that God and the world are radically different. God is creator. We are creature. Infinite gap between the two. Uh, though we can re we can see from the finite world, there is this infinite creator. Yeah, and Jay, if you want to say anything, just you know, feel free to uh, to chime in. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question from Jeff. Um, and I would just respond by saying that unless I misheard, it sounded like Trent said that he affirms the essence existence distinction, but that's exactly what Actus Purus is, is intended to deny. There is no distinction in God between essence and existence. He is pure act. But yeah, I agree with that. I must have misspoke. I, I agree with the distinction, but not in God, but in other things. All right, so this next question is from uh, Puda Spencer. This is for Jay. He says, how do you know your deity is not actively deceiving you? Second Thessalonians 2.11, in your systems claim revelation for morally sufficient reasons. Right. So these kinds of kind of logic puzzles or traps that we might see in like a, you know, philosophy 101 class or like, a, you know, uh, you know, Descartes evil demon example uh is precisely one one way that i could go about refuting that is pointing out that it would make knowledge impossible right in other words i wouldn't have a way to delineate between the true and the false if all reality was essentially fundamentally deceptive in nature so if there's no place for me to have a reference to objective truth then there wouldn't be a way for me to delineate between anything true or false and so now all knowledge all predication all delineation would be, actually be impossible so I would say by the uh, 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 impossibility of the contrary, uh, that would be an impossible worldview to accept or to hold. Yeah. Uh, Trent, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what I would say is that line of argument of arguing that it's impossible based on God having a certain kind of standard. I think that it's valid, though, once again, it shares a lot of arguments with natural theology. On my own uh, premise, I would say that if I argue, if we see God the moral argument shows God is the standard of goodness. The argument for motion shows that God is actus purus, or he is uh, infinite being itself without any potentiality. As such, you would not have any deficiencies or, or absences. Evil is a privation. So if God has no privation, then he couldn't possibly be evil. And as a result, he would just be goodness itself. And so he could never act contrary to goodness. And lying is, always, is contrary to the truth, uh, even... And we can discuss the question of the morality of lying, but I would say that God being goodness itself would not actively engage in the sin of lying for greater utilitarian purposes from man's perspective. Okay, so I, I saw a question on um, an, uh, further back in the chat, but this is from, I can't pull up the question on, on this screen, but on another one. This is from Ayush Manocha, and he says, for Trent, if we start our theology by reasoning from sense data of the natural world, shouldn't all the death we see around us cause us to conclude death is natural? 
I've, I've heard this argument before, and just because we start with our sense data, it doesn't follow that we should end there. If we just look at the world around us, we couldn't determine if the creator was good or evil. All of the arguments for natural theology have to be put together. From them, we see that God is perfect goodness itself. And, from, and because of that, we can know God must have a morally sufficient reason for allowing evil. Uh, I will say, though, that death, whether it's natural or not, uh, the Bible is very clear that God gave Adam and Eve green plants in the garden to eat. So uh, there was death prior to the fall when man invented the salad. So uh, and Aquinas affirmed even that the animals would have still had their predatory ways. Uh, the Bible seems to make it very clear when you look at Romans and what it's talking about is that death and human death entered at the fall, not death in general. Otherwise, you couldn't have had entropy. You couldn't have had the plants in the garden to eat. Human death entered at the fall. But we do believe in things like Romans 8 that God will ultimately uh, bring us out from this world itself to something even greater to redeem creation. Uh, so in one sense, death, non-human death is a part of the finite world, but God will redeem it and make it even better in the new earth and the, the new heavens. Yeah, I would fundamentally totally disagree with that assessment. In fact, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, Paul says de uh, death is the enemy. So for the Orthodox Church, it is fundamental, especially if you read uh, Deification of Man by Paniotis Nellis, who is a famous critic and rejecter of natural theology, by the way, uh, that uh, death will be destroyed. And so if death is natural in any sense, it doesn't really make sense to say that death could be destroyed. In fact, animal death, uh, I don't believe, existed before the fall precisely because uh if you look at Romans 8, the cosmic scope of the redemption that Christ brings in terms of what's fundamental to orthodoxy and, and the, what's called the recapitulation doctrine, which is basically missing in Roman Catholic theology. Maximus and the Council's reca recapitulation doctrine is a fundamental acceptance that all death, whether physical or spiritual, is a result of Adam's fall. And, and I would direct those that are interested, and this is the, the Father Seraphim Rose's great classic big fat book, demonstrates this in about a thousand pages that this is the unanimous position of the church fathers as well as by the way especially for those that uh, are interested in the six ecumenical council saint sophronius's confession which is accepted uh, as a dogmatic statement of the sixth council uh, agrees with us it affirms six-day creation and uh trollo canon 109 which is accepted at the seventh ecumenical council uh, condemns those that believe that death existed before the fall all right. The next question I have here is from uh, PJQ23. He says, Trent, <coughs> do you grant a distinction between vicious and virtuous circularity underlying any system of knowledge? No, I believe that's an ad hoc uh, demonstration that has been created. In fact, the, the vicious virtuous circularity comes from modern presuppositionalists like Cornelius Van Til, John Frame. Um, I don't believe that there are any other logical fallacies where you have a, a virtuous version of it or a vicious version of the fallacy. The reasoning is either sound or it's not sound. And what I think I made very clear in discussing with Jay is that he agrees you can't justify the existence of anything, not even transcendentals like the laws of logic through circular reasoning. He would reject the view logic explains itself, but he's trying to apply this only to God. And that leads us to the problem then of which presupposition do you choose, which not, and either you use arguments to pick one presupposition over the other, which is natural theology, or you just pick the one that happens to be your religion and it's special pleading and it's um, circular reasoning as a result. So no, I don't believe that. If, if, if you need to reason in a circle, P, Q, R, T, P, you don't need to use that reasoning. You can just start with P, P, therefore P. Circular reasoning is unnecessary. Uh, you can just say the thing is true because the thing is true. And then that actually gets you to a kind of foundationalism that Jay uh, was against tonight. Well, again, uh, Trent's not understanding what uh, presuppositionalist and transcendental argumentation is actually attempting to do. He's merely restating his position. And in fact, uh, the whole point, as I said earlier, was that it's a metalogical question, which Trent just seems to reply as if you solve a metalogical question with logic. Uh, it's a metalogical question, meaning it's prior to the doing of logic. Uh, that's why it's a more foundational paradigm level question. And until uh, Trent sees that, I don't think he's going to understand the argument that's being made. And my whole point in drilling down into his strong foundationalism that he affirmed earlier was to show that his own position was precisely circular. Okay, and this, the next question is from Joshua Opel, and he asked to Jay, 
What are these evidences you refer to for Christianity? Well, uh, there's a lot of different types of evidences that I could give, but Christianity in terms of apologetics to the unbeliever is a, I believe, an argument of comparing paradigms. And the reason I think this is not because I intend to, you know, dispense with arguments in the church fathers. Uh, for example, there was a recent book published by, by Dr. Bradshaw, where there's a kind of a dialogue back and forth between Swinburne, Bradshaw, and multiple other uh, Orthodox uh, uh, theologians about this question of natural law and natural theology. And one of the things that Bradshaw noticed uh, noted in his uh, 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 Palamas uh, chapter, for example, was that it's fine to talk about telos and causation in the ancient medieval world. But when we get to modern philosophy, what happens is that there's kind of a flipping of the question to where modern uh, epistemologists after human Kant are really asking and pointing out that you're not really justified in making the move to do all the metaphysics and do all the metaphysical baggage and claims that you're doing until you answer the prior epistemic questions. I'm not saying that skepticism is true because of that. I'm saying that their right to critique the illicit move of doing metaphysics, right, without giving an account of the epistemic criteria first. And so that's what we're actually trying to do here is to critique the worldviews and the systems. And so it's not a battle of evidences because evidences are, are, are I think, theory laden. Everything is theory laden. And Anybody that thinks that it's not, which is really what uh, transposition is, is resting on, is that there's some self-evident non-theory-laden truth. There's a huge uh, uh, burden of proof upon that position to try to demonstrate that that's the case to make natural theology work. In other words, I'm just asking questions pre, right, prior to the doing of metaphysics. And, and Trent just wants to do the metaphysics without doing the big questions that I'm asking. Trent, do you have a response? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, Jay, do you have the Brad the Bradshaw Swinburne book that you could hold up? You have it uh, nearby you? Yes. It's um, feel free to hold that up because uh, I would say uh, that's actually a really good book. I read it as well, Natural Theology in the Eastern Orthodox Tradition. So I thought it made a very positive case for traditional natural theology. So I would encourage anyone to read it. And I think you'll come away with the same positive uh, affirmation that I did. So Jay's read it. I, I, I can see. I would recommend checking that out. Uh, with evidences, I think that's interesting that Jay says, yeah, I think it's great to offer evidences. But I'd like, OK, but if our paradigm was enough, why do we need the evidences? <laughs> that seems to implicitly acknowledge many unbelievers won't accept just a paradigm presuppositionalist argument. They're going to need more evidences to move them. So I might offer to those watching who are presuppositionalists, perhaps you should consider just adding to your repertoire to presuppositionalism also other ancillary arguments like Old Testament prophecy, historical witness of the resurrection, um, maybe planting as evolutionary argument against naturalism, arguments from reason, consciousness. Uh, I believe that natural theology can be a wide, diverse field uh, and, still be, and still be true and good what we're defending tonight. Can I say something or not? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the chapter, obviously, that I would find most uh, convincing is the one about the Greek theologians in the last 50, 60 years that either severely critique or reject natural theology. So if, if people are interested and they read that book, that's the chapter that I would agree with. All right. Next question is from Ryan Pope. So he asked the question, what is the precise difference? I think this is to Jay between a logical question and a meta logical question. Right. So logic is typically dealing with the assumption that logic works and that it functions in the way that, you know, Aristotelian syllogisms, you know, go and then how they pr proceed to the conclusion. Um, and metalogical questions are asking about the status of logic itself, much like math theory is asking questions about the status of mathematical entities themselves. And so that's why I'm arguing. And I, I think it's pretty obvious that those are prior questions to the doing of logic. Yeah, I would agree with essentially that definition, uh, metalogic, or uh, we have philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of philosophy. We're asking for ultimate foundational questions like with yeah. logic, what kind of logic? Um, how do we demonstrate the law of non-contradiction? Is the law of excluded middle uh, always the case? Could that be modified? Um, but I would say that in Jay's presentation, uh, he hasn't shown uh, in, or in order, once again, that he says, well, we need to have a foundation for things like the laws of logic. I gave different presuppos different presuppositions that could explain that Platonism, other you know, other views, other Christian views, non-Christian views. Right. And so you would have to 
figure out what is the true one, either through argument, which is natural theology, or through a kind of circular reasoning or, or assertion. Again, I would just say that that's a category error that using the logic and the argumentation does not necessitate or prove that it has epistemic or ontological priority. This is a question from a Seraphim S. He asked to Trent, if man's intellect is darkened through the fall, how can man use natural reasoning alone to come to knowledge of God, especially with created grace that cuts off God from man? Right. This is called the noetic objection. Uh <clears throat> to man's knowledge of God. You see it sometimes among certain Calvinist authors, but even the first Calvinist thinkers like uh, Calvin himself, for example, wouldn't embrace that. that I, I agree, sin has a noetic effect, or sin makes you stupid, makes you do dumb things, but man can still come to understand God. Like people who say that atheists believe in God, but suppress the knowledge of God, you can't suppress knowledge of something unless your intellect grasps it, evaluates it, and decides it wants to reject it. So even though and I don't believe in total depravity. Uh, even though the, the, the image of God in man is defaced, not erased, we can still, through reason, come to know there is a God, uh, but that predisposes us to the gift of faith. The Synod of Dort, a uh, uh, Calvinist synod, actually said, there is to be sure a certain light of nature remaining in man after the fall, by virtue of which he retains some notions about God. Uh, so even the early Calvinists did not believe man was so depraved he couldn't use reason to know there, there was a God. All right, next yeah, question. I'm, I'm, oh, sorry. Well, my comment on that would be yeah. that uh, there's a great uh, chapter precisely on the very question that Seraphim's asking, uh, again, from St. Justin Popovich for the Orthodox in the book Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ, where he does an analysis of the epistemology of St. Isaac the Syrian. And he shows that the epistemology, which is, again, centered around the doctrine of the Logi, requires the cleansing of the news. Um, I didn't get to go deep into the the, the doctrine of the news, which is again, uh, something that separates uh, Orthodox anthropology from Roman Catholic anthropology. And for us, man's uh, noetic faculty is precisely the the organ that he has to know God directly, whether from reading scripture or whether from interpreting the natural world. And I think uh, St. Joseph Bobovich makes some really uh, convincing, sound arguments that in order even to interpret the natural world, we've got to have a cleansing of the news and the noetic faculty. All right. And uh, this question's for you, Jay. Uh, Dr. Klein asked, would you agree that the justification for the Orthodox Christian God as the only basis, as opposed to the Protestant or Catholic God, is because it has been revealed? So what if there's a, if you read the essay uh, that I'll that I'll send to Suan after this called uh, The Contingency of Knowledge by uh, Dr. Russ Mannion, um, he makes a great point about the comparison of systems and what exactly revelatory theism is. He's, he's not a Calvinist, by the way. And by the way, none of the, the theologians that uh, um, I've referenced tonight uh, have anything to do with Van Til or Bonson. I mean, Van Til and Bonson, I think, have good points and good arguments here and there. But uh, most of what I've talked about, I don't think is is, is at all directly referencing them. Um, the justification for the Christian God uh, in, in terms of how we know God is only based on revelation. And my view is that it excludes Protestantism and Catholicism, even though they have specific attributes in common, just like with, when I mentioned the theistic fallacies paper, it really doesn't matter because if you look at a logical conjunct, and if we were to put all the beliefs that, for example, uh, Orthodox Christianity has in the logical conjunct, uh, in the parentheses, if I took one of those out, um, it's, it's not this set, right? Because what defines this set and every member of the set is the relationship of the set as a whole and each to another. So for example, Greg Boyd's open theism, right? When, when Greg Boyd takes out one of the attributes of God's omniscience or he redefines it to be whatever he wants it to be, it's, it's not this set anymore, even if it's got everything except, right? Just one of the attributes. So, which is interesting because, I, I, you know, Trent kind of conceded a little bit about that when it came to the, the set of necessary attributes uh, in regard to natural theology. But um, if you look at the Garaby paper, uh, which, uh, yeah, I, I think he is uh, an atheist. I'm not, I'm not agreeing with his position. Uh, his, his atheism doesn't really even do with his, his argumentation per se, uh, because I think the arguments are solid. Um, Garaby's uh, point there is that the, if you take the set, excuse me, any member out of the set or try to uh, impose it on another set, it doesn't really work because it only has the meaning that it has within that set or system. 
Yeah, and I would say, as I said in the debate, I don't believe that designator schema in the set works. Uh, both Aristotle and I believed water existed, uh, but I have a lot more propositions about water, its acidity, its triple point, its molecular composition. So I have many more truths in my set about water than Aristotle does. So my concept is more complete, thus more true, but we're both expressing belief in the same wet substance. So I, I just reject that. Yeah. I'll also add that this... Um, Discussion also, I, and I don't want to beat a dead horse because I can make the same reply over and over again about whether it's circular or he's doing natural theology in reverse. I would say natural theology is helpful here as a symmetry breaker because you can use uh, religious experience. You get the same religious, for uh, objective evidence, you could look at two people. They have the same religious experiences, different religions, can't tell which one is true or false. Um, two people offered identical presuppositional arguments with different presuppositions. You don't have a way to break to pick which one or the other, but so, I think natural theology is the the way you can tell which con which conception of God, which system is more true and which is less true. And Jay admits he does that by saying that Eastern Orthodoxy better explains God and the arguments surrounding it than an, any competitor. Right, so which I don't I don't agree yeah, with, but he does. Yeah, Trent is confusing in my view uh, the difference between using logic and argumentation and natural theology. So if from my paradigm or my system, if I'm using logic and argumentation, that doesn't equate to natural theology. In my view, everything that exists is common ground. There's not, uh, you know, these uh, arbitrary sort of list of attributes or commonly general ideas, the way Fazer speaks of justifying the self-evident principles. I don't think there are those things. Um, and so I'm actually making an argument that challenges that presupposition and that assumption and I'm not just making the argument challenging. I'm actually trying to show and demonstrate that the the in the case, for example, of your uh, list of attributes regarding uh, water, the difference here is that uh, the the traits of water are different than a belief system. So it's a false analogy, and this actually comes up in the Garibay paper, and he refutes the very example that uh, Trent gave because belief systems are different than physical objects, and the way that we know the properties or validate through empirical sense data, what a, a, a physical object has or doesn't have is different than the way that belief systems as a whole determine the members of the set. This is why, for example, in the Garibay paper, he lists uh, the Nicene Creed as the set of beliefs as an example of what a Christian theism is. I mean, the, the council is saying this is what Christian theism is. So if that's the case, then there's not a generic theism by which we have a self-evident theory neutral uh, uh, access to personhood or to omniscience or any of the other attributes that we might list. Swan, I lost track. Uh, is Was it Jay, then I, and then Jay gave an extra reply? Well, like uh, I'm just kind of letting you guys hash it uh, out. Oh, okay, and then, then naturally... I would like one little extra reply. Sure. Oh, right. The next question. And then we'll move um, on. Yeah. You could take mm -hmm. out water as an example. You could use belief systems like modern Platonists and ancient Platonists. Both believed in the existence of the same numbers, but modern Platonists have more truths about those numbers with the advent of Cantorian set theory, things like that. But we'd say they're still talking about the same thing, even though one has more developed knowledge. So you could change the example, and the point still remains. Okay, so uh, Trendy Web One he asked the question: Given Jay's arguments about revelation, how does he address those who have no access to the church and divine revelation? Right. So um, when Trent was reading the the, the section where you know Paul speaking to the Athenian philosophers, um, I, I think he misread the text uh, because you know Paul says that the unknown God is the one I proclaim to you. So uh, I think that we have to affirm that there's a sense in which the pagan knows and doesn't know God at the same time. And if you look at apophatic theology via negativa, we kind of say this already, right? We all we, we kind of say that if we say that God's essence, for example, is unknowable in the, in the, the Orthodox tradition, we're saying um, something in a sense that's cataphatic, while at the same time we're saying something that's apophatic. So we're not defining it and we're saying something about it, namely that it's unknowable. So this is a feature of apophatic theology, and, and my reading of Acts 17 in concert with Romans 1 is precisely that Paul is not granting them that they have direct access to God via the creatures per se. I think Romans 1 is primarily talking about the innate sense of God, and actually many you know early church fathers believe that as well. A lot of the, some of the texts that uh, come up in the Bradshaw book that I think uh, Trent was referencing earlier on in the debate are actually talking about the innate senses divinitatis, the innate sense of God, which I think is the moral law. And But there's this curious quote where, where Paul says to the pagans, the word is near you, even in your heart. The word is not a generic concept. 
the logos in John 1 is not a generic concept. Christ lighteth every man that comes into the world. So I would literally say there's a sense in which, yes, they do and do not know the Trinity. And that's precisely because, according to Romans 1, Paul's not arguing about um, the conclusions of philosophers there in Romans 1 uh, in terms of syllogisms and God at the end of a syllogism. In Romans 1, Paul is talking about the heart of man. Again, the no, the noose doctrine of orthodoxy is what we understand Romans 1 to be talking about that the heart of man knows in its inner sense that it has sinned against the one true God, even though at the same time he doesn't know the one true God. Yeah, Trent, do you have a response? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I would say that, as I said in the debate, people have a relationship with God, one, because God sustains everything that exists. Uh, they have a relationship with God, even if they don't know it. Um, the other ways they can come to know God would be through uh, through revelation. And I think I made that clear in my statements when I cited Romans 1 uh, and other videos, and Jay would agree with me, Romans 1, Paul is drawing a lot from the book of Wisdom. And in Wisdom 13, it seems very clear that the, the author is saying that you can perceive that God exists uh, through the things that he has made. And the error of the pagans, he says, is they stopped at the midpoint and thought that the things they perceived uh, they, they didn't go all the way to the thing that made those things. Uh, but as for Acts 17, I think it's very clear here. Uh, I found an altar with, an, with this inscription, to an unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Uh, so it seems clear to me these people uh, knew there was a God. They knew it was worthy of worship, uh, but they knew nothing else about this deity and then Paul told them about it. But notice Paul doesn't talk about Old Testament, he doesn't mention Jesus. Instead, he continues common ground with them by quoting uh, Greek poets. And of course, the Lagos was also a concept widely in Hellenistic culture. He's not necessarily using the Johannine concept. Yeah, I feel pretty bad because there's a lot of people who are still asking good questions, but we run out of time uh, for this section. And so now we're going into our five minute rebuttal uh, section or portion. And so, um, yeah, Jay. Uh, I have one point to that yeah sure real mm -hmm. quick i would just take issue with the end statement that paul just tries to stay on common ground i know in fact paul goes directly to the resurrection he says greek wisdom is foolishness and he goes directly to the resurrection of christ all right uh jay or, or trent do you want to say anything in response to that or do you think we should just go to rebuttals Right. Yeah. I, I, okay. Yeah. I, I'm saying here he did preach Jesus and resurrection, Acts um, 17, 18. Uh, I'm just saying in the part where he's addressing those who worship specifically. Well, but you I, said he didn't go into Christ in the Old Testament. Right. Well, he, he certainly didn't talk about the, um, the Old Testament. You said he sure. didn't go into Christ or the Old Testament. Okay. Well, then I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. I'm talking about okay. the specific section uh, where he's talking to those who are worshiping the, the altar of the unknown. Yeah, but in that section, he does talk about Christ. He oh, said, no, I agree. And I agree okay. that, that Paul does talk about um, resurrection. He uses miracles and their ability to help people see that God has revealed himself. Absolutely. All right. And with that, um, I'll let Jay Dyer uh, get ready to give his five-minute closing statement. And so um, once again, Jay, like once you get down to 10 seconds, I'll kind of expand the screen and everything. But whenever you start talking, I'll start uh, your five-minute closing statement. All right. So um, I think that what I really wanted to get to here was the epistemic problems of a um, an approach that Trent has to strong foundationalism, which you affirmed early on um, regarding the way that we go about doing natural theology. What I heard from Trent throughout the debate in many, many instances was actually equivocating and um, word concept fallacy shifting between natural law, moral law, the revelation of God in nature and his Thomistic conception of natural theology. My whole point in this debate was that those things are not equivalent. But multiple times in the debate, Trent seemed to switch back bef between the, these different things, which are very specific and nuanced, as if they're all just talking about the same thing. Of course, my questioning here is to raise that very, I'm, I'm questioning that very assumption right there, that I, I don't think those are all talking about the same thing. Um, I wanted to really stress that this approach that Trent's doing is an empirical approach. I didn't say Trent or Aquinas was an empiricist. I said the approach is empirically based. And that's not in doubt because in De Veritate, Aquinas clearly says that there's nothing in the intellect that's not also in the senses. He also affirms the distinction between what is better known in itself and what is better known by us. And this is really 
the basis of the, the foundationalist approach that we have here. If we're going to take that approach, we have a series of problems that I raised one as an example of properly basic beliefs in terms of the section when I was questioning Trent about circularity of properly basic beliefs. This is just one problem for any empirically based epistemology. And make no bones about it, Trent's natural theology is an empirically based natural theology. So he's going to have to demonstrate the justification for the empirical argumentation that he's doing to say natural theology is a case when I am saying that natural theology isn't the case because I can come to the table and critique the presuppositions in the exact same way that Hume and Kant do that you're going to have to give an account for. And why do you have to give an account for it in that way? Because of the nature of your presuppositions and the foundationalism itself. Foundationalism is saying these are self-evident. These are the things that everybody agrees on that we start with. What well, does it matter how many people agree with something or disagree with it? That's a appeal to the masses fallacy. And so if Trent's going to have a foundationalist epistemology, he's going to have to answer not just that, but the questions of what is the metaphysical content of all the words that you're listing here in terms of this sense data? What is the status of the external world that you're presupposing in these metaphysical claims? What is the certitude that you have that the sense data matches up to the objects in the external world? How do you solve Seller's problem of the myth of the given? How do you resolve the underdetermination of data? How do you account for the fact that the peripatetic axiom itself is not in sense data? How, if that's the case, do you account for induction and deduction on an empirical basis? What are the primary, what are the properly basic beliefs, given the fact that I don't think the ones that you listed are actually properly basic beliefs? given the critique that I gave of, of Descartes' cogito. Um, if that's the case, and we start with induction, how do we get to the justification of universals, right, from induction? So if deduction is a problem, excuse me, if in the induction is a problem, deduction also goes. What is the justification for the epistemic bootstrapping project at the outset that, that Trent is involved in, given that, as I tried to show, there are no properly basic beliefs, and also given the fact that things like the uniformity of nature, that logic works and operates in an external world, or that the external world actually has a causal relationship that it imprints data upon Trent's mind. Nothing in that was a affirmation or an accusation that Trent is a Humean empiricist or that Aquinas is an empiricist. I never said that. So Trent was replying to a straw man. I simply said, how does Trent re reply as a foundationalist to these classic problems for any foundationalist system. It really doesn't matter which one we pick. One thing that I really wanted to conclude with was about the arguments of St. Maximus for the Trinity. And I'll just run through these really quick. Maximus thinks that the modes of natural contemplation lead us to the Logi, which leads us to the Logos. The Logos is a rigid designator, not for generic reasoning or Marcus Aurelius's Logos, but in fact, for, as Trent said, the wisdom literature Logos of uh, Ecclesiasticus, Proverbs, and John 1, who is the second person of the Godhead? It's a rigid designator. Creation, then, according to St. Maximus, is fundamentally Christological and fundamentally triadic. Ambiguum 10 shows that creation is a veil for the Logos. The created world, Maximus says, is a book. It's a book that's the same as the Logos in terms of the Bible book, right? Maximus this goes on, of course, to say that the created order is a theophany. And my main point here is that natural theology posits a deity that does not allow uh, the uh, created world to actually be a theophany. Uh, and I think the Thomism uh, demonstrates that. All right. Thank you, Jay. And sorry, I don't know if you heard me chuckle in the background, but there are just some funny comments. And uh, I just want to say, uh, was it Kyle Myers? He appreciated that this debate was fruitful. And so we've, we've been getting good reception from uh, on both sides. And so uh, Trent, you, this is now your final statement. So let me know whenever you're ready. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll start the timer. Sure. Well, once again, I want to thank Swan for hosting this. I want to thank Jay for taking part. He brought a, a rigorous and well-developed case, and <clears throat> so I appreciate that. Let's do an overview of what we talked about. Remember, Jay had the burden of showing us that Christians should abandon natural theology. So the burden is on him to show why we should give up something that has been practiced uniformly across the church for 2,000 years in Scripture, as I showed. Um, what arguments did he give for that? He basically just kind of gave two arguments. Uh, one was a critique of foundationalism. Uh, he gave a lot more critiques of foundationalism in the closing statement, which I see no need to reply to because they weren't previously brought up in the debate. But I would say that I showed, and I think it's very commonsensical, 
that we can affirm there are certain self-evident truths and we can reason up from these. They just, we interact with them and we see their truth and that it's self-evident. And I think I made it very clear, infinite regress doesn't work. And I showed all of the problems that set, end up if you try to go through a circular route as my opponent does. So I would say his idea to critique foundationalism to get rid of natural theology, uh, it, sim it simply doesn't work. I'll also add there's a wide variety of natural theology schema. I have one, Richard Swinburne has another, William Lane Craig has another. The, the common thread that runs through them is the ability of reason to know that God exists. Now, my opponent said, well, there is no generic theism. Uh, it's the Logoi. It, everything is, is the Trinity. If you can't show that, there is no generic God that is a person. And I would say if you believe that, you're going to have to believe some really strange things. Uh, even leaving aside the old, the old Testament patriarchs having explicit knowledge of the Trinity. Did a Jew in exile in Babylon know that God is a Trinity with the same confidence that I do or Jay does? Uh, under his view, it would seem like you'd have to say, yeah, if they prior to Christ, that the Jews in exile in Babylon or the Jews in the time of Job uh, knew that God existed, that they had the same knowledge of the Trinity. Not just that a patriarch interacted unknowingly with the Trinity, but the same knowledge, belief in the Trinity as us. I would say in philosoph philosophical speak, that's highly counterintuitive. Uh, but let's talk about, um, but that's what you, you get with this kind of circular approach. What were my arguments for retaining natural theology against the resolution we should reject it? I said we have freedom in Christ. So this is our default position that we should stay with. If this was such a problematic thing, if this was so problematic uh, that Christians should avoid uh, this type of theology, wouldn't we expect the Bible to condemn it? Wouldn't we expect the church to condemn it? Uh, bishops, uh, others in, you know, in the East, in the West, ecumenical councils. Uh, my opponent agreed that no ecumenical council has condemned natural theology. Um, and in fact, I showed that the First Vatican Council condemns those who say that we can't use natural theology. I said the Seventh so, Council. Well, okay, okay, you can talk about it later after the debate. Um, so I think that was clear. And then I showed how it was used. And you can go back and listen. Uh, maybe I could upload my opening statement and you can read through it. How natural theology is used, even among the Eastern Fathers, to guide non-believers by showing them things in the world that naturally point to God. This is very obvious in John Damascus's Expedition of the Orthodox Faith uh, and in Gregory Mnis's Great Catechism. I show that presuppositionalism doesn't work, that my opponent is either doing natural theology backwards because he then he sees he starts with Orthodox Christian God and then he sees there are these effects, but then he makes arguments showing why you can't presuppose atheism, Judaism, Islam, Protestantism, or Catholicism. You have to presuppose his version of God. If he's using arguments or human reason that tells us something about the attributes the one true God has, he's doing natural theology, but he's just doing it in reverse. If he doesn't do that, which kind of what he was doing a lot in trying to say why Orthodox Christian reology, theology ultimately because it is revealed. How do we know it's revealed? Because it is. Well, any presuppositionalist from any persuasion, Van Til, Frame, Protestants, Catholic presuppositionalists, could make the same argument. If the argument works for all of them equally, it doesn't work at all. So I would say that ultimately that uh, this is not a good system. My opponent has not shown we should give up a mainstay of theology. Instead, we should explore it. We should make it better. Uh, we should gather insights from it. Uh, and there are forms of natural theology that are very close to the transcendental arguments my opponent made. If you're interested in that, check out Alvin Plantinga's work on warrant and function and his evolutionary argument against naturalism. Very similar to what Jay brought up, but I would say it's within the bounds of natural theology. But I'm grateful for everyone. And as I said earlier in the debate, I say we should just follow what St. Peter said. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope within, but do so with gentleness and with reverence. All right. Well, thank you, Trent. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I've been looking at the comments here. There's a lot of positive comments to, about both sides, really. And uh, I think Hallelujah said it best when she said, hit the thumbs up on your way out. Thanks. And please check out, um, you know, Jay Dyer's channel and Trent Horn's channel. And also, uh, Jay, I'll make sure to upload your your notes, you know, after the show and everything like that. But uh, one, thing that, one thing I take issue with was that uh, I did explicitly say that I think that the Seventh Council implicitly does condemn the natural theology that he's advocating. So I did, that's all I wanted to correct. Let me, let me just step in really quick and just say that, um, 
let's see here. Well, so a lot of people asked if you'd be willing to do a part two with each other. And so maybe this would be a, a launching point or something like that. But I think we have to kind of end the discussion right here, if that's OK, um, for the sake of time. But um, I mean, with that, gentlemen, thank you so much. And I appreciate it. But yeah, let's see if we can get a part two or something else going. But yeah, I'm open you. to that. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Sure.